Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria, and today we are going to talk about our senior design project, which is Alpina Parking Garage, and it will be presented by our team members, Bailey, Jack, Nick, and me. In this presentation, we will go through project description, location and map, transportation and structural design, cost estimation, and finally, sustainability. First of all, first of all, the parking garage is located in Alpena, Michigan, and in this area, the businesses are growing, and with that growth comes more clients and workers. Therefore, there is growing need for, for parking. From these pictures, you can see the exact location for the parking garage, which is located at the water at the corner of Water Street and Second Ave. Impacts and constraints. Uh, we are required to design two stories of parking garage with flat floor, and the height of uh, and the height of floor to the bottom of the beam should be greater than or equal 10 feet. Minimum column space, spacing 27 feet. Uh, the size we uh, the size of site we are giving um, 90 by 250 uh, feet. Our goal is to design 100 or more parking stalls. Uh, the cost should be at uh, or below 30,000. And these constraints allow, allows for adaptive reuse of the building. For our design, uh, for our design, uh, we encountered multiple alternatives, but the critical analysis of alternative that we that we focused on was the selection of pre-cast, pre-stressed pre and cast in place uh, elements. And uh, each of them has its own advantages and disadvantages, and we compared them based on their criteria. For cost estimate, precast pre-stress is more accurate than cast in place and steel. For durability, precast pre-stress has high durability since it, it's, it has a lower water to cement ratio. For sustainability, steel comes first since it is 100% recyclable uh, without loss of quality. For maintenance, cast in place required less maintenance than precast pre-stressed and steel. Owner preference is precast pre-stressed uh, since, since it is easier to design. Time to construct precast pre-stressed uh, takes uh, less time than, pre uh, than cast in place and steel. Therefore, according to this criteria, we decide to choose uh, precast pre-stressed um, concrete to design to construct our uh, parking garage. And now I will hand it to Bailey to talk about transportation design. You mean Jack? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so before we could determine our parking layout, we had to figure out where our entrances and exits were going to be. To do this, we looked at the annual average daily traffic in the area, along with the speed limits. Um, from this, we determined that the minor street was Water Street and the major street was Second Avenue. Um, from the PCI manual for pre-stressed parking structures, uh, it's recommended to place the exit off of the minor street. And also, given sufficient room to work with on Water Street, we determined that a two-way entrance and exit would be ideal for this layout. With low traffic volumes and a speed limit of 25 miles per hour, we determined that a stop sign would be sufficient to control the traffic coming out of our parking garage. Next slide. There you go. Mm -hmm. So this is a drawing of our first floor layout. Uh, you can see our two-way entrance and exit on the right side here, uh, off of Water Street. So after discussing several different configurations and layouts, we determined that one-way angled parking would allow us to maximize the number of parking spaces in our structure. Our layout was driven by the constraints given by our sponsor and guided by the PCI manual. 
with 114 total spaces in our, our structure, um, five handicapped stalls were required to satisfy the, the uh, ADA requirements in the PCI manual. And um, one size fits all parking stalls were chosen to be used as they accommodate for large and small vehicles and um, allowed us not to have to alternate stall sizes throughout the structure. Um, also with a clearance greater than eight feet, two inches, uh, ADA vans will be able to access this floor. And on top of that, uh, pedestrian entrance and exit could be placed in the bottom left corner of this drawing to allow for easier and quicker access into the downtown area. Uh, next slide. So this is a drawing of our second floor layout. The main difference uh, is the location of the entrance and exit due to the ramp. Uh, the ramp spans 130 feet at a 9% slope, which is better than the 10% recommended in the PCI manual. Um, the ramp is two-way with uh, 10 foot lanes of the slope to increase to 15 feet at the entrance and exit points to increase user comfort and safety. And um, also with no roof on our structure, snow removal had to be considered. Um, it can be plowed into the hashed areas in the corners um, and even take, take up some parking spaces if needed during the winter months. It could also be blown off the back into a safe location where it could then be plowed if needed. Um, with all of our handicapped spots being on the first floor, uh, pedestrians could walk up and down the ramp, which could also be widened to allocate this uh, them a safer pathway to do so. In the top left, in the red square, that's a proposed future staircase, but a staircase was not in the scope of our project. Next slide, please. So as I said, our um, dimensions were driven by the PCI manual and they meet level of service A as shown in the table below. The majority of our parking spaces were angled 60 degree with a 10 foot 5 inch stall width projection and a module width of 54 feet, an idle width of 16 feet 5 inches. Uh, the total spaces in our parking structure is 114, which satisfies our requirement of 100 spots or more. And then in the bottom right, figure, you can see uh, the dimensions for the U-turn at each end of our layout. At first, we had this at 16 feet 5 inches, but after um, using MicroStation Auto Turn, we determined that it was a tight turn and therefore increased it to 22 feet 5 inches. And with that, I'm going to send it over to Bailey to talk about the structural aspect of our project. Thank you, Jack. Here we're looking at a 3D model that we created using Autodesk Revit, just to give you guys a better idea of what the structures that we created. So as you can see, it's 248 by 90 feet, the corner of Water Street and 2nd Ave, with an you know, entrance ramp up the back side of the structure opposite of Water Street. Additionally, there's going to be an entrance drive that'll be the exit and entrance uh, for the first floor and second floor uh, perpendicular to Water Street, opposite side of 2nd Ave. Additionally, on the slide, you can see we have a side profile from Autodesk Revit, uh, just showing that we've satisfied that 10-foot minimum from bottom of beam, the slab height that we were talking about, as well as showing the four-foot partition walls that we have on uh, the first and second floor, just to keep people from driving over the edge or uh, walking and falling over the edge. Additionally, this satisfies the 70% open requirement for parking structures to be open in order for toxic gases to escape. As you know, we decided to design precast members. Of these precast members, we just chose double T spandrels, inverted T beams, L beams, and columns. Uh, this is very typical for precast parking structures. Uh, as you can see in the bottom right corner is an example of one of them being constructed. You can see the columns have little ledges uh, that the beams span between, and then the beams themselves have ledges so the double T spandrels can span the parking deck to give a nice smooth finish. 
We decided to use double T spandrels instead of like a slab uh, because they allow for higher strength over longer distances up to 80 feet. And in our case, we had 45 feet, so we thought it was appropriate to use these double T spandrels. Uh, the beams themselves were designed for flexor shear, and since they have these ledges on them, we had to design for the transverse bending of the ledge, longitudinal bending of the ledge, and attachment of the web to the ledge. Then the columns themselves were designed to withstand the axial and shear forces. On this slide, we can see the loadings that we applied in a RISA model to gain our moment and shear diagrams. Uh, the live load we took was 40 pounds per square feet, which was recommended from the PCI parking structure design manual. The dead load, which takes the self weight of the beams and the double T spandrels into account. And then the snow load, which we calculated based off the snow map of Michigan. These loadings are different based off of the different tributary areas that are acting on each beam. As the inverted T beams has 45 feet of the tributary area and the L beam only has half of that. And then the L beam of the ramp is only 10 feet since we only have a 20 foot ramp. Also, you can see the loading on the ledge in the bottom of the slide. Uh, this takes the live dead and snow load and converts it into a force per stem that is going to be acting on each ledge so that we can calculate the reinforcement required in the ledge. On this slide, we can see our column design. Uh, we came up with a 12 inch square column with six number four uh, bars to withstand the axial force and then number three stirrups at eight inches on center to withstand the shear force. The L-beam design is shown on this slide. You can see in the left side uh, the geometry of the beam that we chose, which is 18 inches at the top, a 26-inch base, 24 inches tall with a 12-inch ledge. And then on the right, you can see the reinforcement required to withstand the uh, loadings that we applied. Uh, there's four number nine bars at the top to withstand the positive moment, four number seven bars to withstand the max negative moment, and then number four bars at 10 inches on center to withstand the shear. The number three stirrups at 12 inches on center within that ledge ensures that the web stays attached to the ledge. And then the number four bars in the, that run longitudinally along that ledge ensures that there is no longitudinal bending of the ledge. And then that number three bars along the face of the web ensures the transverse bending of the ledge uh, is within the limits. The inverted T-beam was designed in the same way as the L-beam. Uh, however, we have much higher loadings on this considering it has a higher tributary area that is acting on it. Uh, you can see in the bottom left uh, the geometry of the beam that we chose, which is 18 inches at the top with a 34 inch base with 12 inch ledge for a total of 24 inches tall. Uh, and then you can see on the right the reinforcement again. Uh, we have five number 10 bars to withstand the positive moment, four number eight bars to withstand the negative moment, and then number four stirrups at five inches on center to withstand the shear. Uh, you can also notice that the reinforcement inside that ledge is very similar to the L-beam. Uh, this is because the force on the ledge is the same as it was acting on the L-beam. Also, it is governed by some PCI minimum standards that are in place, so that is why those bars are pretty much exactly the same as they were on the L-beam. The double-T spandrels uh, were one of the simpler things that we had to design in of the components. Uh, because the PCI design manual gives us a table that has different span lengths, different types of double T's, different strand types, as well as the safe superimposed load that can act on them. Uh, so what we chose was an eight foot wide by 24 inch deep double T spandrel. Uh, it spans approximately 43 feet. With strand type 128-S, it can take, take a safe superimposed load of 160 pounds per square feet, which is higher than the required loadings that we had acting on our uh, parking deck. Also, you can notice in the picture down there, uh, there's a two inch black topping, which is gonna be a cast in place concrete topping. That's gonna allow for a smooth finish. Uh, and then that was also calculated into the dead load of the structure. Since we chose to do precast concrete, we had to think of connections, uh, which is one of the more important things in precast concrete. Here are some examples of the connections that we had in mind. Uh, for the column to beam connection, we have a little ledge on the column with a bearing pad that the beam will rest on and they'll span between. And then embedment plates in the top of the beam and the column will be welded together by a strap plate. Additionally, the double T to beam connection will also be the same, uh, where the double T spandrel will sit on that ledge that the beam has on top of bearing plate. And then the strap plate will weld the embedment plates together to ensure a strong connection. Uh, additionally, after all these connections are made, that's when that two inch topping is gonna come over so that we can have that smooth finish and then we can adjust the grade for allow, to allow runoff off the structure or into the drains. Um, 
Also, after that two-inch topping goes into place, we will cut and caulk the edges so that water doesn't get into these joints and cause problems over time that will require additional maintenance and uh, more money for the city of Alpena. I will now pass it off to Nick, who will talk about the cost estimate. Thank you, Bailey. For our cost estimate, we used the software RS Means as our main cost data, but we also did quite a bit of research on other parking structure estimates that are online to make sure that our cost estimate was full um, and we weren't missing any super big um, line items. For our scope of work, we excluded geotechnical work, so there is no earth, very small earthwork, and also no foundations are included in our cost estimate. As you can see, concrete is the majority of our material used in our cost estimate. This also includes the reinforcement because that's just how RS Means grouped it. Uh, contingency, we added based off of our sponsors range between five and 10%. We chose nine to for what we felt was an accurate representation. And then another high number was the equipment for the stalls um, for payment to collect payment when cars enter and exit the parking structure. Next slide. So here shows a table that has our material, labor, equipment, direct cost, plus the overhead and profit built in to give us a grand total of a little over 1.5 million. And then when you build in the contingency of 9%, we're sitting at 1.7 million, a little over 1.7 million. This gives us a cost per square foot of $67.41. And our cost per stall a little under 15 grand, which is well under the 30 grand that our sponsor would like. Even though we excluded geotechnical work, I feel like we'd still sit under that 30 grand. Next slide, please. So here's a cost estimate analysis with the WGI Wantman Group Incorporated National Average. Our cost per stall is down because our scope isn't quite whole. We're missing that geotechnical and earthwork. Um, and then our cost per square foot is high. I relate this to, we have a smaller footprint than some parking structures with only 22, well over 22,000 square feet. And we really tried to pack as many spaces as we could into our parking structure. So that could also relate to that. Along with WGI gave a number of between 2.5 to four spaces per thousand feet, thousand square feet. So then ours calculated is 4.54. So we're also above that. Along with it, WGI says the state of Michigan is on the upper end of parking structures and how expensive they are. So that could also relate to our higher price per square foot. Next slide, please. For our project sustainability, our main choice was to go with precast concrete instead of cast in place. This is more sustainable due to the high, the lower water to cement ratio, the lower waste since it's prefabbed in a manufacturer and the concrete can be more accurate and then higher durability. Also with the amount of recycling materials that you can use that it could be local materials. So the cost of shipping those materials could be um, lower. Also uh, our sponsor would like it if possible and the parking in the future goes down and we don't need the parking as much parking to reuse the structure. And with how we designed and laid out our concrete that this, the first floor could be reused into an office or homes or whatever um, it may be. Another part of sustainability is the global electrical vehicle movement. Even though outside of our scope had the main utilities, this could be something our sponsor could look into adding ports for um, people to charge their cars when they park. Next slide, please. So for the overall design summary, our group decided to, with what we were given, to have cast in place concrete um, we had an exterior ramp to maximize the spaces inside our parking structure, which is located on the back end of our parking structure. We got 115 spaces in our parking structure with a total cost of a little over $1.7 million. Next slide. Here's our acknowledgments. Our professor, Dr. Haynes, Dr. K, Dr. Atanayaki, and then our sponsor, Dustin Black. And with that, we are open to questions. Okay, I have one key question. Uh, how do uh, drivers access the second floor? 
You want to go to that slide, baby? Um, it's in the references, I think. Are you asking how they access the second floor from the ramp or from the entrance drive? No, for people. For people? Yeah. Oh, they for, can. For people, our yes. idea is we have that uh, red box on the second floor that was the proposed second floor or proposed staircase um, that we didn't include in our scope to design. But there is space there for staircase to go in place, as well as since we put all of our ADA parking on the first floor, that people may be able to walk down that ramp. Uh, it may just take them a little bit longer to get down to the downtown area, but they're able to walk down that ramp to um, get off the second floor or get up to the second floor. So this could give a little stairway for now? For now, yes. And also, did you check the, all the, uh, the, uh, the turning radius? from the East Peter second entrance. I'm not sure that you have enough uh, the turning radius available. Uh, we checked the turning radius is on the, around the turns here inside the structure. Um, we didn't check it on that second floor, um, this turn here. And we realized that that will be a tight turn, but considering that this only has 59 spaces on the second floor, um, and that's gonna be used for a combination of short term and long term that the volume on that ramp isn't going to be in, in excess to where people are always going up and down at the same time and that vehicles may just have to kind of wait their turn to come down or just stop for a second and let someone complete their turn before going up the ramp. Yeah, it could also be widened to um, maybe take away a couple spots um, to increase the turn radius and because we're above the constraint of 100 spots by 14. Um, if we took out a couple, we could allocate them enough room or provide signage or a speed bump. I got a, I got a question about the structural design. Okay. Uh, particularly the uh, double T beams. So if you can go back to that slide, showing double T. And I, I assume these are pre-stressed being pre-cast yeah. pre-stressed. Okay, yeah, this one. So uh, have you looked at like the strand pattern and what kind of pre-stressed steel you're gonna use? Uh, we just took the strand type that was given on that table, which was the 128-S. Um, we didn't look at what the layout of the steel of that looks like inside that, um, inside the double T. I couldn't find what it was, but we would just be able to ask for a quote from that for, um, like, to get the price of it. I see. Okay. So you just uh, used the PCI table. Yeah. Pick yep. up, pick this beam, but you didn't look at the detail of the twist jazz design. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my question. <clears throat> yeah, I will follow up Dr. Hu's question regarding to structure design. So can you just move your slides to the beam load? You showed there's a table. So yeah, because I see those loads are in pound. So can you Give me the idea, like how those loads are applied on those beams, you know, because you are given the load quantity as in pound. Um, I think that might be a typo where we meant to go pound per foot. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. more reasonable. You know, the load yeah. typically yeah. for beam is pound per linear foot, not, not like a concentrated load. Yeah, another question I have regarding to beam is, did you ever consider there's possible torsion when you know, there's not the even load on both sides of the like inverted T beam. So, did you consider that in your design for those inverted T beam and L beams with the eccentricity of the load? Um, for the uh, as far as the torsion goes, I don't believe we designed for the torsion itself. But when we were designing for those ledges, uh, we designed them for the inverted T as if they were being 
since you're going to put them together with one invert, one double T on one side and then do the whole side and then the other side. So we designed it as if um, the force on that ledge was going to be only acting on one side um, and not both sides at the same time. Yeah, but in that case, usually we induce a torsional moment, right? On the yeah. beam but with the eccentricity because you know, it's not perfectly applied through the center of the beam with the, the, the wedge um, on the side. So, so you, you may just consider the load applied through the center line of the beam, right? Which is a simplified model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, probably more precise, you know, that those eccentricities should be considered in the design. Yeah, thank you. So I have one quick question. So in your product, so you use uh, Octax Revit, the beam solution to do the modeling, right? So, so what's other, I mean, what did you do with the beam model? So it's only for the 3D visualization, or you will also use the, you used the beam model, for, for example, to do the quantity takeoff? For, the Autodesk Revit model that we created was just for visual for everyone to be able to kind of see what we were making. Um, the beams we drew in AutoCAD and then we had the lengths and that's how we took the quantity takeoffs from there. Um, since they were all the same span lengths, we were just able to take that cross-sectional area and multiply it by the length that we needed. Um, so we didn't use Autodesk Revit to take the quantity takeoff or anything. Okay. So did you model reinforcement, the rebar, in the in Revit? I did not in the Revit, no. Only only in the concrete, right? Like uh, not so very detailed, uh, like uh, modeling for for the for the design joints. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any final questions for this team? All right, here so we we'll get ready you for have our a team. Sorry, I have one question. So you have a team. So how do you work as a team to assure the accuracy of your analysis and calculations? Uh, using RISA and also through several meetings online and at the library working on everything. Yeah, originally. When we put it into RISA, it gave us the estimate of what we thought it, what they thought it should be. And so we went back and double checked that. And then we worked together. When one person completed the beam uh, design or the column design, we went over it together to make sure that there wasn't mistakes in it. Okay, that's teamwork. Thank you, teammate. Uh, next up, our